All right, well, it is 5.30, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Happy snowy Monday here from Fort Collins, Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us for Curator Conversations, Threads of Our Community, Part 2. I hope that wherever you are tuning in from, you're excited for some warmer days ahead and that your Ram pride remains very strong. I wanna thank you all for participating tonight. You are in a webinar, so that's why you cannot see other people besides just our presenters, but please use the chat function to communicate with us or the Q&A feature. If you click all panelists and attendees, that way everybody can see your chat. Um, and if you haven't yet, please feel free to add where you're watching from, your name, and what year you graduated if you happen to be an alumnus. Wherever you're joining us from, we are very glad that you're here. Many of our attendees are CSU Alumni Association members, so thank you so much for your membership. It makes all of our programming and events possible. To learn more about membership and to explore all that the Alumni Association has to offer, please download our mobile app. And you can actually take a photo of this QR code on the screen if that's helpful for you. We also, if you aren't a member yet, we hope that you consider joining during CSU's Day of Giving on May 6th and 7th. During this 24-hour online giving event, CSU alumni, students, friends, and faculty and staff will come together to support student and alumni success, faculty research, and critical resources that will help encourage a brighter tomorrow. It is the perfect time to take your RAM pride to the next level with a gift to an area that is most meaningful to you. In just a moment, I'll be putting a couple things in the chat for you all with a helpful article if you're having any technology issues, my contact information as well. And additionally, the CSU Alumni Association has many virtual programs coming up, so I'll provide a link to our website. We will also send out a recording to this webinar as, long, as well as some awesome additional resources. So be on the lookout for that email either later this week or early next week. And then later on in the event, I'll also include a survey. And if you'd like to take a moment to fill that out, we greatly appreciate your feedback. So this night is not about me though. It is about my wonderful friends and I'm very excited to introduce you to them. We have wonderful speakers here with us tonight from the Avenir Museum of Design and Merchandising. So I am going to go ahead and pass it over to wonderful curator, Dr. Katie Knowles, who will introduce the other guests. Katie, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. Um, if you just saw the slideshow disappear, don't freak out. We don't have <laughs> yeah, slides do because we have three, um, uh, I have two other curator friends here with me and we pulled some, some fun stuff from the collection for us to talk about with you all. Um, and just as a reminder, um, this uh, program is in connection with our virtual exhibition, Threads of Our Community, um, which you can still visit um, if you go to our website, avenir.colostate.edu. I'm sure somebody will throw that up in our chat for, for you all. Um, where you can read more and see some old photographs and documents and things that our friends at the CSU libraries helped us digitize last summer and fall um, and read more details about the history of the collection that then became the Avenir Museum of Design and Merchandising. And that is thanks in very large part to Linda Carlson, Curator Emerita, um, who was the curator of this collection and museum for 23 years, I think, I'm getting that right. A long time, um, but she really helped grow our, our collection and um, got it moved over here to this beautiful facility that we have now um, on the east part of campus. And um, our other presenter that's here with us is Megan Osborne, who is our assistant curator and collections manager, and she will tell you that if we ever move this collection one more time, she is quitting her job because she's moved it three times, the whole collection, which is a huge task. Um, and so she also helped us move this collection over here and has been here with the museum for 11 or, is it now 12 years, almost 12 years? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm the young kid around here. This is my fourth year here at CSU working with the, with the museum and the collection. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be joined by both of them and then our, um, our other person who's here who will be moderating our Q&A from the audience in the second half of our program is Heather Short. Um, and so you see her there in our beautiful reading room. So we're all here at the museum spread around the building. Um, we've got, we've let Linda let, 
let her loose in this in the collection storage room. Um, so, <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to start off. I'm going to start by asking them a few questions, and then we will um, move into the audience Q and A in the second part of our program. So, if you have burning questions, just um, keep them in mind. And Linda's going to go turn the lights back on. We have, you know, we're CSU is very green. And so we have an auto on off on our light system that she's going to be dancing over to, to turn on and off. <laughs> um, so I think I'll start by just asking both Megan and Linda if you all could talk a little bit more about how you met, because I think that's a really wonderful and interesting story and kind of how you um, came to, to know each other and to be here at the museum together. Sure, do you want me to go first? Go as well. <laughs> oh, I don't know if anyone else, but I can't hear you, Linda. Okay. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna have to speak up, Linda. Am I, can you hear me now? Mm, I think a little bit. I want, it could be the lapel mic. Maybe it needs to move up closer to her. Uh -oh. oh, now it's gone. I'll be right back. Okay, uh, Heather, maybe let's try just taking the mic off and Linda can talk really loud. So Megan, if you could go ahead and start answering while we I'll get it. Hold it. Does that help? That helps. It's gonna be hard to hold artifacts. Yeah. yeah um, so, um, I'll just, Linda and I met, she doesn't remember. Um, it was 8 a.m. on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, my junior year of college. Right. I am also an alum, CSU alum 04, woohoo. Um, and I took historic costume and historic textiles from Linda and just loved, the classes. And um, we were talking about this when we were preparing for this um, event tonight. And she, of course, said she didn't remember because I was a good student. So she was a good know. student. She wasn't <laughs> the kind that I had to worry about. <laughs> One she of them. The class, she performed well. She knew how to take care of the collection when we handled it. And so I didn't remember her. But <laughs> when she came class. back and we got together, it yeah. was just really a wonderful fit. It was wonderful. I was working at a museum um, across the highway in Windsor and a woman I was working with knew Linda and knew that she was looking for help actually moving the collection from Gifford yeah. here to our current location and suggested I come talk with her. And of course I knew who she was because Linda is such a, for, I see some of you in the chat ha took um, textiles and costumes. So you know what a wonderful professor she is. And she made such a mark on my life just in those two semesters. And so I jumped at the chance and we sat here in so what is now fit. my office, used to be Linda's office. Yeah. And um, she said, I want you to come work for me. And I said, when? <laughs> yeah. And it was the smartest thing I ever did. And I hope it was the <laughs> smartest thing you ever did. It's Absolutely. been terrific. And then we had, gosh, 10 years before you retired mm -hmm. of just the most fun. We did. It was exciting. It was an exciting time because it was growing. It mm -hmm. was um, falling into place. It was yeah. really exciting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It was great. And then um, it's so lovely because Linda is so close. Um, she comes back regularly. Her grandsons pop in. They know this is not the avenir to them. This is yeah. their grandmother's museum. This is grandma's museum. And as we walk by it, it's always, you know, grandma's museum. So when we change the name, you'll know why. So <laughs> yes. when you all start invited to the opening of grandma's museum. Grandma's museum. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sorry. We're, we're trying to figure out the, the microphone so that we can all hear Linda and she can pick up the stuff. So we, we can hear you now, Linda. Okay. Okay. Did you put maybe clip it up on your turtle? Nope. I'm holding it. Okay. Because well, it was clipped on there and I don't know that it was good enough. So I'll hold it and we'll play a little bit and see if we can make it work. Okay. But you know, um, <laughs> all right. So um, I think the next question that I have for you both is kind of more about um, how you've seen the museum and the collection grow over time, um, which again, like, you know, a lot of this is traced in, a, in the online exhibit that we did, but maybe Linda, if you can start us off and just kind of talk about how you joined the collection mm -hmm. um, and then um, kind of pick up where, where Megan came in yeah. and what's happened um, in the last dozen years or so. Yeah, well, we, we don't, you don't need too much detail from me, but you know, I was an at-home mom 
and in 1986, I was making lace. And I heard that the collection had a lace collection within it, and I wanted to see it. And that really was, is what piqued my interest in coming to graduate school, which is exactly what I did. And then in 1988, when I finished my graduate degree, I simply took over as curator. The faculty with whom I had been working was leaving, and I was offered the opportunity. And it was just, it was wonderful. It was just a passion that allowed me to pursue things that I hadn't dreamed of before then. So it was terrific. At that point in time, it had about 8,000 objects and it was housed up in the third floor of the Gifford building. And um, it just kept growing and growing, sometimes not the way we wanted it to, but growing and growing. And um, it allowed us as it grew to get more selective and to help determine policies and directions on to where we wanted to go and what we really wanted to do. And that's really when Megan came in then, is when we needed someone to really help facilitate and control that growth and the move over to this space. Mm -hmm. I think Linda's politely saying she needed someone to tell her no. <laughs> I did need somebody to tell me no. She wasn't, she, she, she wasn't forceful enough in, en in enough areas. We won't talk about aprons tonight, no, but I love them. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of great aprons. I can understand <laughs> having a hard time saying that. Um, more than you need. And then, you know, when we moved over here, the first the first kind of move over, we we had the storage area and the and a, and a smaller classroom, mm -hmm. and then we had the gallery that's in the main university center for the arts building. Right. Um, and now we have this additional part of the facility that really kind of came about as you were kind of retiring, Linda, mm -hmm. and then Megan has been here. Um, that's when she moved the collection away and then back again. Um, and then we grew into a museum that has all these multiple galleries in the same building right. um, and our amazing, now massive, huge Linda Carlson classroom, which um, I have to say has come in handy for our whole department during this pandemic. We right. have enough room for our social distance classes. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been actually kind of, as we've been close to all of our, our public visitors, we've seen a lot more students coming in and, and using the building for classes over this last year, which has been actually really, yeah, that's really great. great. Um, so we're, we're hoping that that continues um, now that everybody, I don't know, we might be upset because now everybody knows our secret about our awesome <laughs> classroom over here. We're all going to be wanting to come. Um, and I think the the next thing um, we'll do is just kind of transition in and talk about, I'm sure people are a little curious about some of the stuff that is there behind Linda. Um, and so Linda came in a couple of weeks ago and right. we, we messed around in the drawers and the, and the closets and picked some things that we um, wanted to talk about. And I I don't actually know why all of these things were the things that, that were picked. And I think that the the one I am most curious to hear about why you both, because this I think was the first thing Megan said, oh, let's oh. get the cat out, is yeah. the, the the orange beret. The Eve, and it's an Yves Saint Laurent. It's an, yes, an Yves Saint Laurent with a wonderful tassel from the 1960s. And so why, Megan, were you like, oh, that's the hat. We got to pull that you know, hat. What, when that, you're right, is the absolute first thing that came to my mind. And I don't even really, I'm just going to try to remember why. <laughs> but whenever I see that hat or think about Linda, that is the piece that I think about. And I think because I know that she loves orange. There's another orange dress that we couldn't yes. pull just because the size didn't work for this format. Right. And I, the orange, and I just remember you talking about it so lovingly. And I think it might even be like back to when I was in class with I you. I bet it was. I remember yeah. that. And in I remember measure, specifically talking about the tassel. Yeah. No, I think in good measure, it's because it's from the 1960s and that is my era. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at these things of course they have great memories for me which is what costumes all about anyway it helps us relate to our history and look at our future 
And I just adore this hat because I think it's so indicative of the 60s. And certainly that orange is part of it. Things were yeah. bright. Um, and I love Saint Laurent. I think there is no greater 20th century designer than Yves Saint Laurent. I think he was a magician, uh, just an incredibly creative man. And so that's why I really adore this hat. I think it's a beauty. So I think what we'll have to do, I just, just popped into my mind, but we'll have to take these pieces that we pull and maybe this fall, put them out on exhibit in the hallway so that people who are attending this, because Could come see you cannot see yeah, the amazing really detail tell. of the tassel of that hat just does yeah. not translate in this format. So we will put them out. So you guys, everyone who's here can come see them. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yes, we can call it Linda and Megan's favorite stuff. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Sounds like a great exhibit. Um, well, while we're on the topic of hats, can you grab that other little brown hat right uh -huh. there? While we're doing that, do we want to try to have Linda take off the microphone so she can hold up things? Um, I'm not, I, we can try. Linda, you're going to have to unplug the little thing from the laptop too. And then I'm not sure if the sound setting is going to be correct. I'll run back. Thank okay. you. If you expect me to deal with the technology, I'm in trouble here. I can um, hear it a little bit while we're waiting. That little sure brown hat is an Elsa Scaffarelli hat. And it's, um, when Linda's able to bring it closer to the camera, it has this very fun little tail at the back. It's like a little monkey tail. Um, and then it comes to a deep um, peak in the front of the forehead. And it's just really indicative of the playfulness of Scaffarelli hats. You yeah, know, she was the, was the one of the shoe hat and the lip bag. You know, she just had such a wonderful sense of um, frivolity and joy in her designs. And I think where Yves Saint Laurent was such a master of the construction and the detail, she was also a 20th century designer, but a master of fun. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Yes. Great. So now I can just talk Great. and just not hold nothing up. That's yeah. a lot better I'll project. Project. than the microphone. And okay. Okay, go get that Scaparelli hat. And I, I always bring this out when I talk, I talk about Scaparelli when I teach historic costume. And um, I always bring this hat out because it's just, it is, it just so captures her spirit. It's wonderful. Yeah. And it was especially, you know, talking about it this semester was really especially fun to just remind all of ourselves yeah. about how, label as well, if you can see that. how important I think fashion is to all of our lives and Scaparelli really I think contributes to that because she was some a designer who just celebrated the joy and pleasure mm -hmm. of of clothing and design and fashion and that hat is just I would if I could maybe wear one thing if we were allowed to wear <laughs> anything in the collection I would love this to put on that hat. Okay. It's, Yes, so fun. It is. Um, so I like to think about who wore it and mm -hmm. where they wore it and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes, and you know, both of those hats have been in our collection for quite a while. A I very think. long time. This one exactly. we've had since um, 1978. So that's one of the earlier, yeah, earliest, I think, things in our collection. A wonderful treasure. That, that kind of came into the collection, so. Um, all right, we've got one more hat back there. One more hat. Let's, let's pull that hat. This hat has a very different story. I do know about this hat. Okay, see if I can show this to you so you can really get a look at it. And so you're looking at a Chinese dog hat, a child's hat. It's, it's just, called a dog hat because it's not quite coming through, but those little scallops, there you go. It's sort of like little, ears, here. little ears. Yes, little ears. I mean, the construction is just absolutely exquisite because it has um, gold couching on it, held in place on the surface, really beautiful embroidery, all done on velvet with then um, also brocade ribbons hanging from it. It's just a marvelous hat. Mm -hmm. I hope you can see it well enough. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful. And I think that's another one where, you know, the exhibit that we're now going to do in the fall of these things, you really can see. And this, yeah. this hat also was in an exhibition um, called Window to the World. Wasn't it in that exhibit? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the first exhibit of the new 
uh, the of new the gallery, gallery in the, the university main building. building. Yes, right. 2009. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, that exhibit must have been so much fun to put together. And I know you worked with a graduate student class to, to mm -hmm. get that, that exhibit put together, but the name window to the world um, really captures what our collection is because it is just this window into the amazing world of textiles. And I think that that hat is a, is a wonderful example of that, um, of the variety of things that get produced around the world um, yeah. and just how beautiful they all are. That's what they are. Um, somebody is asking, um, oh, so there's somebody who was in that class is here. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for putting on such a great exhibit. All those years ago. <laughs> well, I hope you were you know, revisiting this hat. Um, Sarah, who worked on the red um, Zodiac jacket. Am I oh. orange Zodiac jacket? Am I right, Sarah? Are you that, Sarah? I can't see your last name. Oh, kimono, right. Sarah. Oh, kimono. Okay. <laughs> Which was also a great object. <laughs> um, okay. And, and, um, Linda, somebody else also asked if you can grab that Scaparelli hat again and show yep. it from the front so that you could see what it, like it, it would be, how it would be worn. I've always thought it would be wonderful to do a hat exhibit. So here's, here's my head, a hat exhibit. So you could suspend the hats and then you'd have mirrors so you could pretend to put it on because we all want to put on the hats. <laughs> we all love the hats. We've We're talked about that. that. We've yeah. been working on. We just I would love that mounting because I've been working yeah. on it for a while and we can't yeah. figure out how to mount them. But. It would be difficult, but it would be such a treat because yeah. that is the thing you want to put on. If if there's anything you want to put on when you're here, just like Katie would wear this, <laughs> we all want to wear a hat. Yeah, and I think because we don't wear hats really in our real lives, right? There's such. Yeah objects that are so known to us but also so foreign in our everyday life because we just don't wear hats right. like people used to yeah absolutely Holiday so there it is the front. you'd have this little funny <laughs> feather sticking um, right up in the front. yes it's a it's quite quite a fun hat it is um all right let's see what else is back there on the table let's see let's there are some machines Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, I don't know if to call it a real machine, but I know this is one that Megan thought about right away. Yeah. Putting out and tanning. So you want to talk about this, Megan? Yep. So that's called a sewing bird and it's a piece of technology that helped people sew. So the tail, um, you pinch it and the mouth opens up. There you go. And that, the open mouth would hold onto an edge of fabric. So you could hold it taut as you were working on something. And the, there's a little cushion at the top, kind of on the back of the bird, and then right there under yeah. its beak too. And so those are little pin cushions. And it has, it's a C-clamp. So you would screw it up and clamp it onto whatever surface you were working on. But the the workmanship on that, so I mean, you could, those oh, things are around today, but they're just, they're not as beautiful as that particular one. The, mm -hmm. the design on the clamp is even, you can kind of see it now, is just so intricate and so lovely. Yeah. And, what an interesting way to put together a relatively simple tool, but just to make it so beautiful. And then yeah, that it's a lovely brings so much enjoyment. Yeah. And so functional because so this functional. is exactly what you need is that mm -hmm. third hand to really hold fabric taut when you're stitching. Yep. So it's just really a beautiful tool. Yep. Yeah, and it looks too like I'm not sure about the t the pin cushion on the top, but the one, the bigger one that's down below the bird looks like it used to maybe be a little more kind of burgundy. Yes, really vibrant mm -hmm. color too. I think it was actually a velvet. It looks like a velvet of what's left of that pile. Yeah, but um, yeah, I think it was a beautifully made and and um, just a lovely tool mm -hmm. for a lady stitching. Yep. Yeah. Oh. And what a great name! And even the ones that aren't bird shaped. They're called sewing birds because sewing birds. initially they yeah. were bird shaped, and it's just fun. Yeah. It's fun. Yes, I and I think that that's a great point. That even the the tools that people used to make things when they were making things by hand, the tools were also very well made, and mm -hmm. a lot of care and attention was put into that making that whole process yeah. so enjoyable when you were making right. something. Um, let's grab that other tool that's back oh. there, which I will say, I, def I 
I would say this is like a machine. Yeah. Um, and I'll say, you know, a lot, some of our, our tools that we have in the back kind of heavier. like torture devices, <laughs> we've actually talked about like doing some kind of Halloween thing of whether it's, you know, tool or torture. <laughs> um, and so can you tell us what that is, Linda? This is a pinking machine. So as you look at this wheel here, and as I turn it, fabric would be fed across the tabletop here and it would do the pinking. So actually scalloping that edge on a piece of fabric. Um, so I'm assuming it predates pinking shears, um, but I don't know that for a fact. But again, it's got a C clamp here at the bottom. It is quite heavy it's and would get heavy. put on the table and you could pink the fabric. Now, tell, can you explain for people who might not sew or know much um, about fabric why you would want to pink? And so pinking is like the little, right, little, little triangle yeah. shapes on the end of your fabric. Why right. would you pink the edge of a fabric? It will keep it from fraying by trimming those edges and exposing different little threads within the fabric. And so you won't likely have as much pulling away of the fabric. So it keeps it from fraying. It's a, an edge finish, um, a simple one and not the most sturdy, but um, it would be a way of finishing those seams to keep them from pulling apart. And I, if, if we were using it again, we'd need oil. It's fairly noisy. <laughs> You're now wondering why we call it pinking. But oh, um, I, I don't never, know that. I never thought about that. I have no I've idea never thought why. about that either. Yeah, why uh -huh. would you call it pinking? I don't know, but yes. I think it's a great That's tool. one of those times when if a student asked me that question during class, I'd say, I don't know, you're gonna have to look that up and tell you me. You have to look it up. <laughs> That's when you put it back on the students, say, look that up and come back to us with that yes. information. Um, so I like this. We gotta keep moving because we got three okay. things left to talk about, I think back there. And so let's grab like that last smaller piece twall? on the table, your twall. My twall. You hold that up a little bit there. Uh -huh. And so toile, um, this is something, the word toile simply means cloth in French. It's T-O-I-L-E. Mm -hmm. um, and so this can be a, a term that is used when you're making um, a garment. Sometimes you make what's called a toile, which is just like a, a test kind of um, to make sure that your pattern pieces are gonna all fit right together and you can make adjustments so that you don't waste your good fabric. But the word toile also applies to these historic fabrics um, like the one that Linda's holding up that come from a place called Jouy en Josas in France. Um, and so they're often called toile de Jouy or cloth from Jouy. Um, and so can you uh, tell us a little more, cause that was one that you asked, can we pull a toile? Why is that something that you wanted to pull out for today? I love the patterns cause they're these large scale often kind of pastoral sorts of scenes, people and peasants, ladies on swings and, um, and very large scale. But it was a technique that um, is generally in one color only on a, just an off-white or a white uh, fabric and generally a cotton, although linen would be perfectly appropriate. And it was a, done on, with a copper plate. So it's, it's similar but not the same as kind of a block print although it was huge they were big so that you could do these large scales and then they were the, the etching was done on the copper plate it was lowered onto the fabric once the dye had been applied to the plate and then compressed onto the fabric so the dye was then um, added to the fabric for the design I just adore them because I think they're such a wonderful, wonderful, uh, incredibly complex technique that allowed printing to become a little more exciting, a little more interesting, a little more vibrant. Um, it's not just, and when you see twalls anymore, we generally think of them as more um, interiors sorts of textiles. Um, if you've been to palaces, they might be on walls. It certainly is good for upholstery, but this was also, these large designs were done on apparel. So it's not something that was limited 
to an interior. And I think it was probably more fashionable than interior to start with because it was an expensive technique to do. I just think you're fascinating. And the other thing about that particular piece, I don't know, it's not coming through on my screen. I don't know if the rest of you in the audience can see, but that printing is actually mauve. It's a purple. Yes. And that's not very typical. Usually for twelves, you see blues, mm -hmm. reds, sometimes green, but mauve is a rarer really? color to find in a twelve. And so that's one of the other reasons that we wanted to pull this one, just because the color, um, and I wish it would come through better. It's just, it's a yeah. beautiful, vibrant Perp soft purpley color. It's just absolutely yeah. lovely. Yeah, and that those purples they don't survive as purple very much because that yeah. dye stuff, as it ages and is exposed to the light in particular, it turns brown, kind of a really like baby poo brown. <laughs> it's not very pretty, and so then it sort of you know it goes off and it doesn't look as as nice as the purple. And so even when those purples do survive, they're not purple anymore. Um, and so, you know, having that one is, is great to have because it yeah. is still that, that purple shade. Um, and I think that's a great point about the copper plate printing and talking about technology and textiles um, is, you know, something that I think we're all interested in and thinking about technological advancements. And then also with these twalls, like the incorporation of the artistry of copper engraving. Yeah. And one of the things that's so interesting to me is if you look at a lot of those scenes that are printed on the fabrics, you also see them printed on paper and because it's the same, it's the, like a, the same or very similar engraving and it's the same type of process that they were using to print engraved designs on paper. And they're so detailed and, and such wonderful examples of the, the artistry and design of textiles. Um, but while we're on the topic of technology, and textiles, I'm going to ask you to kind of pop back there behind your table and grab that bodice. This was one I think Megan suggested we pull. Um, Megan, you want to kind of talk about yeah. this bodice? We, this we is one of my this favorite lot pieces. For class. Um, yeah, I all whenever a class comes through, I always pull this bodice. Um, it just it's really simple, really unassuming. It's brown with white polka dots, which you can all see, and on the lower right corner that sleeve side that Linda's pulling up you can see the big hole of course but what a, the other thing that's happening here is the white polka dots are starting to deteriorate so the brown fabric is in generally pretty good condition but every almost all of those little single white dots are starting to break apart and that's because this was discharge printed so it was um, dyed all in brown and then the polka dots were um, discharged with a bleach sort of solution to whiten them after they were brown. And so that bleach has long lasting effects. So this is a piece from the late 19th century. Um, and that, the reason I like to pull it out and show it to students is because the person who designed and produced this bodice could not have foreseen in you know 120 years what would happen what would be the ramifications of their design choices. And this is a piece where you can really see the, the exact changes that are happening to the garment in real time. And I just think it's fascinating. I've really been drawn a lot lately to the how things in our collection are deteriorating. I think it's just a really interesting area of study. And so this is one of those pieces that really shows that so very clearly. Yeah. Yeah, I we were just, I was talking about this, this earlier today with my class, my graduate class, we were talking about whether or not it's important to collect things that are kind of falling apart or deteriorating. And in particular, we were talking about like how in the future, how people are going to study our time period now and what we wore because so many of our clothes, they're not, they're fast fashion. They're really not made to last very long. And a lot of them are made from really experimental textiles that we don't know how those are going to age. Um, and this is such a great example of much earlier in kind of the industrial revolution and, and a process of, you know, bleaching that is hundreds of years old. I mean, people have been doing discharge printing around the world for a long time, um, that it kind of brings that to your attention. And it, it does make it clear kind of why, in particular, a collection like ours at the university can help teach people about the passage of time and, and what your what the choices that you make now 
and kind of the consequences that those can have much mm -hmm. further into the future. And for our students who are going into the apparel industry um, and the interior industry as well, of just thinking about the materials that they're going to use and, and what those are gonna look like in 120 or 30 years. I have to say too, it's a great, it's a great example of fashion style. It from is fabulous. That period it's a beautiful, too. Beautiful garment. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, I've saved the, the last thing, the biggest thing. I don't know how you're going to hold this up for us luck, because I know it's probably one of your favorite things because I know how much you love these objects. Yes. She's got it. She's got I it under control. Let's see if I can show it to you. But if this not, is I can a, come hold it. This is a paisley shawl. You could. I'll come. Okay. This is a paisley shawl. Let's see if I can get it up so you can actually see it. Megan's going to come help you hold it. Okay. Then. I'm just going to sit here in my office. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Um, Megan's put her mask on. She's being very good. Yes. Well, I should tell Linda is fully vaccinated. So we're, we're yeah. being COVID safe here. Um, I adore yeah. Paisley shawls. And, and I'll tell you, I had an opportunity. I had a fellowship that allowed me to go to Scotland for seven weeks in the early 2000s. And I spent two weeks in Paisley, Scotland at the Paisley Museum. And um, what an exciting and really extraordinary experience it was. But this one I particularly adore. Um, it just is, has the paisley on the corners. Later they become huge and with these long drooping paisleys. This one is um, a fold over. So when you fold it into a triangle, you always have the design showing. But what I also love about it is if you can, this is why it's a wonderful idea if we're gonna put these on display. If you can even begin to see this, this one is all embroidered. This one was not done on a jacquard loom, which made absolutely phenomenal paisley shawls, but this one is embroidered and pieced. And so you can see all the threads and all the pieces on the back side. This is uh, not only just a, an incredible work of, of craftsmanship, but um, um, a years in the making, probably two years to make this absolutely incredible shawl. And I just adore them all. Yes, they're really, again, you know, the, I think the Paisley shawls to me are such an interesting story of how they came from Kashmir and in India yeah. to Europe and the kind of in this technological advancement moment of the invention of the jacquard loom and how that type of loom, which uses this very intricate punch card system to yeah. guide threads, it's kind of an early form of computing actually um, yeah. to make the, the designs that look very similar to what um, Megan and Linda are holding up that was all done with hand embroidery and, and the hand weaving that was done in cashmere is also very intricate and time consuming. Yeah. Um, that the jacquard loom makes the, the paisley shawl more available to a wider market of people um, who can afford the shawls. But it also, you know, it it is an interesting story to think about then what that does back in India to the the Kashmir um, weavers and, and kind of how they were making these things. And the fact that we call them paisley shawls, because that's where they were from in Scotland, where they were yeah. known for, rather than cashmere shawls. Um, it's a, it's a really, I don't know if you're interested in learning about this. It's a whole, very complex historical story um, that is, I, the 1800s is my favorite time period that I study, and so I, I find the Paisley shawl very interesting. Yeah. Um, it's that industrial revolution. It was such an exciting time, and it was really about textiles. Yes. Um, and yes. Such, to such a great extent. Just can marvelous. you, I don't know if you can back up Megan and kind of show us the end of the roll so that people can see. Um, so you can just see how many times that's rolled on this roll. This is quite yeah. a large shawl. And so as Linda mentioned, you would fold it on a triangle mm -hmm. um, and kind of drape it over. And it would, if you think about in the 1800s, the big, huge skirts that they would wear, and it would just kind of drape down behind you onto your, um, onto your big bell skirt. So it's very dramatic fashion. And then the colors, of course, so vibrant. 
Um, and I know too, Linda, I think that was maybe one of the first exhibitions that you did when you were the curator of this collection was about Paisley shawls. We were in the Gifford building, yeah, a long, long time ago. Yeah, there's a really great picture, I think, on the virtual exhibit of you and Jack Kerfman working uh, on that exhibit. Um, and I think we have some photos of people visiting that exhibit as well. It looked like it was just... I mean, what a stunning exhibition to have all those huge shawls yeah. um, with so many different colors. You can put it down, Megan. <laughs> yeah, it's getting a Megan's bit. getting her arm workout. Yeah, she's getting, okay. she's pumping. And one of the interesting things, there were a number of years where um, when we did exhibits, we'd have some of the school children from Poudre School District come over. And one of my favorite things to show them was indeed a Paisley shawl and to ask them what it was. Well, what do you think this is? And most of them thought it was a rug, which would be a logical thing for a, a 20th century child to think about. And so it was a wonderful way then to introduce changes in appearance and in clothing and talk about how this was worn and what it really was. Um, so I, it was just always one of my favorite things. So. Yes. Okay, well, we've talked about all of the things that we pulled out and we're, yeah. um, we have about 20 minutes left. And so I'm going to have, and Heather's here again. Um, and so I guess the other thing I should mention is that I'm here with Linda and Megan, who are both alums and Heather, who will be an alum soon, who's going through our MBA program. So I'm the only one day. Not alum here. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that the Alumni Association welcomes me here as well. Um, <laughs> So maybe someday, oh, I don't know, probably not. I don't think I'll ever. I'm know. still not in that group. I have two more years before I'm technically in that group. So. I'll be there. It'll be a <laughs> yeah. blink of an eye. Yeah, but we're going to turn it over to Heather's going to moderate. I think a couple of questions have actually already come through. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and start those. And then um, if you want to type up some additional questions in the chat, um, feel free to ask those and we'll see if we can get to them. Yeah. So before I do that, feel free, put your questions in there. I'm going to write them down as we go to make sure we don't miss any. And at the end, if I, I'll ask if I missed any and we'll go from there, but we definitely have already had a few. I definitely wanted to do a quick couple mentions for Linda. So she knows just cause she hasn't seen some of the chats. Um, but Matt says who you, you know, he says that he makes all of his students describe fashion in all of their papers for his history class because of you, Linda. Oh, and I'm then, <laughs> right. I figured you <laughs> yeah. wanted to hear that. And then Lynn, um, who also took your historic class costume, or I'm sorry, your class of historic costume is also here. And so is Tom Lundberg. And I knew you'd want to probably oh, know. Oh, I adore Tom as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I figured you'd want to know that. Um, and then, so our first question was actually, when would a child have worn the um, monkey tail Scaparelli hat? Oh, I think that's actually about the, the boy. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Exactly. About the dog yeah. hat. I think yeah, it's a little confusing because we pulled the scaparelli back. Yeah. That's I okay. Think that was about right. a five-year-old, wasn't it, Megan? Do you recall? I think that's what. So this hat came to us from one of our really wonderful longtime supporters. Yes. He's a collector of Chinese textiles, and I believe it was a five-year-old boy that is the yes. documentation for that. Right. Yeah, and it's I think Perfect. tied to a specific ceremony. I think you can tell none of us are experts in Chinese textiles history, it, no. um, but it, it's it's tied to a particular ceremonial mm -hmm. use, and so there's a whole ensemble that goes with that, and the hat is part of the whole ensemble. Um, it only has a hat though. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we <laughs> whole outfit out anyway, but. <laughs> and I do, since Tom Lundberg's here, I do feel like, Linda, we need to apologize for not pulling his very favorite blue and gray striped bodice from the We should have, century. you're right. I'm really sorry, we've missed that one. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do better next time. Yeah, I'm sure the email does to let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, and then the next question was, are there any modern day equivalents to the sewing bird? Oh, you can still get a sewing bird. It's yeah, not can. as beautiful. They're not as pretty. Bird. You can, they come in plastic and yeah. I'm sure there's metal ones around. Mm -hmm. um, ours is just particularly beautiful. Yeah. And you can find them too, you know, at antique shops and, mm -hmm. and stuff that, you know, so a lot of the time I think they, they show up at those places and nobody really knows what they, what right. they are, what they're yeah. for, um, but you can certainly yeah. find them in, in those spaces as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then a, another question about the bird device was who made the bird device? Oh dear. Oh, I would think oh, some no. sort of metal smith 
um, but we don't, our documentation does not have an actual maker. Is no, there, we don't have a maker. There's not a mark on it anywhere. I think it would take some real. Not to my knowledge, but yeah, it's been a long yeah, time. No, I don't see that. one automatically, but. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. All right. And then the next question was, how does one go about donating items to the collection? Well, we are currently in a collecting moratorium um, due to the pandemic, but we are also trying to get our house in order a little bit. Um, we're, as you can see behind Linda, there are many, many, many cabinets full of many, many things. Um, and so we're actually undertaking a full scale inventory. So we will probably be um, limiting donations. Of course, there's always exceptions. Somebody has a Chanel little black dress. You call me right now. Call me right uh, now. Yeah. Um, but um, for the most part, we'll be limiting donations for a little while yet. Um, but if you check our website, we have a donations page, and that's always kept up to date with all of the FAQs, with the form that needs to be filled out and submitted with photos. And then I um, personally review all of those, and then Katie and I um, make those decisions together as to what will be coming or what will be accepted into the collection. Um, so that's sort of the process right now. But yeah, kept, keep checking our website. And as soon as we are accepting pieces again, it will be updated there. I'll uh, put a plug in for a Fortuni. I'd like, I'd love us yeah. to have a Fortuni in our collection. Yeah, anyone have a Dior? Let's see. A Dior, <laughs> Just mild Dior plugs right Dior. here. <laughs> Just a few plugs, you know. Um, awesome. And I'll say too, you know, one of the things that has happened over this last more than a year now is that we, most of our, um, like the processing of new things that come into our collection is done by our community volunteers and they have not been allowed to be here. And so we have paused partly due to that because we just don't have the help from our mm -hmm. volunteers that we need in order to, to do that work. Um, and we we have a few things that, that had come in prior to to the pandemic starting and that that kind of moratorium putting being put in place that we're trying to get to get processed and, and um, wrapped up before we start you know resume collecting um, things and so we're we're really we're missing being able to sit around the work table with our volunteers and chat but it's also just our collection I think has been lonely it's been missing all of its people to come and play with it and um, help take care of it. You know, we've been here in the building to make sure everything's okay, but it just has, has been a, a slowdown in that part of, of the work because we just rely so much on, on that volunteer assistance to do that part of the collecting care. 100%. That was lovely. Lovely put. Next is Linda. What was your most nerve wracking textile object transport loaned or donated and why? Oh my goodness. It's a I, good question. <laughs> good question. Transport, something we moved, huh? I just, what, what was it real quick. I don't think if for me, <laughs> Linda, you'll remember this too. It wasn't an object, but the mannequin. Oh yeah, mannequin moving is a nightmare. A, a I can even remember when you mentioned that, mm -hmm. uh, working with other faculty members, with Jan Els, who taught historic textiles before I did, and she was a marvelous collector of saris. And for one of our uh, professional conferences in Denver once, she was doing an exhibit, installing an exhibit, and we took a van full of mannequins down. Um, you know, it was a, a large van that had windows in it, and you could see arms and legs kind of laying sideways, um, which probably was most amusing, but mannequins are a nightmare because, of course, they're fragile. Um, Very fragile, but also hilarious. Well, they are hilarious. Yeah. I remember a story once. I it was right before I started, and um, some of the mannequins were being moved from Gifford over to here, and there was a student helping who was a swimmer. And apparently, she had one of our seated mannequins in the front oh, yeah. of her car wearing her swimming goggles. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> to make it fun, right? <laughs> as well, the mannequins. Megan, I know, dressed the mannequins as ghosts and reindeer, mm -hmm. and when yeah. they were. Getting They've ready. been featured on our social every yeah. now and then. Yeah. We also, my class Pilgrims. this semester has worked on an exhibition about mannequins. And so when we reopen to the public, um, we will have an exhibit that's actually just about mannequins, um, which is 
it's kind of a crazy looking exhibit. They went ahead, they got it installed before we went um, into the remote part of our last part of the spring semester. And it's, it's kind of wacky, but I feel like it's a wacky time and we'll just have a wacky exhibit. <laughs> Well, and what's so critical about mannequins is that that they have to they have to fit the clothes have to fit them, and so mannequins are not of one style, but uh, of a variety of styles, um, based on what the figure was like and what the clothes are like. So it's they're really so critical to what happens in an exhibition of costumes. Absolutely, they're they're conservation. Mannequins are yes. conservation. I'm just laughing yes, because someone it. posted in the chat, are there inflatable <laughs> mannequins? I was um, just about to say, we should yes, jump to that question. <laughs> I believe there are inflatable mannequins, however, not of the variety we would use in a no. museum. <laughs> no. Yeah, and I tell, like, we often have to kind of pin things around or pin things underneath and that thing would pop. <laughs> that would be terrible, wouldn't it? I, mean, I can't imagine a zipper getting when you're trying to zip something up and it gets stuck in there. Yeah. Well, hot underneath the lights and halfway through the exhibit, your mannequin just no. withers. <laughs> um, but I will, just in the interest of time, jump to a couple other questions because we've got a few more. But I will say Monica agrees with you, Megan, about mannequins. Um, <laughs> just from someone who understands. Please echoes. move them. Yep. Um, so I'll jump over to another question. What happens to items that get eliminated from the collection or does that happen? Um, yes, it does happen. It's a very specific process called deaccessioning and it's not something we take lightly at all. And usually there are two main reasons for deaccession from our collection. Other museums handle it differently, but we either remove things because they have deteriorated to a point where we cannot care for them or their deterioration is posing a threat to other items in the collection. That's the number one reason something would be removed. There's a whole um, series of paperwork that has to be gone through committee approval. Um, and then if that's the case, it's disposed of in the most um, safe manner. Um, the other reason that is much fewer and far between would be if we got a better example of something. So say we got a paisley shawl in that was in better condition, in better shape, and you can see the paisley shawls are large, they take up a lot of space, we can only accommodate so many. And so were there to be one that would be long term better for the needs of the collection, for the needs of the students or researchers, um, we would consider removing a piece to add another, to replace another, um, but th that's much, that's, those are ex circumstances that are very few and far between. It really would be deterioration would be the number one thing, so. Yeah, right. it's a, it's a very specific detailed process that doesn't, it's not like we would just decide one day that we were gonna throw something in a way that that would never happen. Um, why there are still many, many, many aprons in the collection. <laughs> exactly. Somebody is asking if we would share deaccession pieces to other universities. Yes, that is, that is something that could happen. Um, if, if we actually have things in our collection that were deaccessioned from the Denver Art Museum. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes a museum will reassess, and this is just a really natural part of, of what museums do. This happens at all museums, deaccessioning, where maybe your mission shifts and changes, or you get, like Megan said, a better example of something um, that um, you might offer it to another museum that you know might be able to use it and it will go to their collection instead mm -hmm. um, and, and be used there. And so it's, it's often, it's a process that really is about thinking about caring for these things, which is really what, what our purpose is and what, what we're really committed to doing. Um, and if it can be used better somewhere else, then it should be better, it would be better used there, it should go there. If it's um, something that has, you know, certainly is threatening other things because it might be like some things with like plastics, they can off gas um, and cause deterioration to the things around them. You wouldn't want to keep that in, in the vicinity of other objects. And so for the sake of those other things, you might need to deaccession that one piece um, and get it away so that it's not damaging things. So it's, it's definitely part of the process. Perfect. And we have time, I think, for the existing questions, just in the interest of time. Um, and so first we'll do, are there any Native American 
pieces in the collection? No, there are not. Um, and that's a really specific reason that, and thank, thanks to Linda, there are not, um, and not because there's anything negative or anything wrong with Native American pieces. Those pieces of art are absolutely wonderful, but they are representative of cultures that are still existing. And there are a lot of um, rules and regulations that surround Native American pieces in the museum world. Some of you may be familiar with the NAGPRA um, legislation for repatri repatriation of objects that were involved in burial ceremonies and those sorts of things. And so Linda made a really conscious decision early on when she took the helm to not bring those in because we didn't have an expert um, in them. Many of those pieces can't be handled by women, which is also an issue. We are a staff of females at this point. Um, and so there aren't for, for some of those really practical reasons. I will say we okay. did, so we, while we don't have traditional native pieces, we did in 2019 have an exhibition that Megan curated with Orlando Dugai, oh. who is a contemporary women's um, fashion designer, but he is Diné or Navajo. Um, and we did collect one of his designs. And so it is an example of native American fashion design um, rather than traditional textile design. So we do have um, one of his exquisite pieces in our collection um, now, but that really is, you know, it doesn't fall under these existing rules and regulations that Megan is talking about. It's a fashion object rather than a textile. And we or, did actually purchase that from Orlando um, through a fund, through the, the Linda Carlson Acquisitions Fund that is here at the um, part of our um, endowments. And so we were able to purchase that piece. So support the artist as well as preserve the garment. So it was really wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. And I will just say small plug that you can see that garment on our Instagram and our Facebook, should you <laughs> wish to go through and scroll through and see and it. And it will also be going on it will. In, in May. So. It will. Yeah, it will. Um, and then we'll jump in. We have two last questions. So just for your, um, just for your knowledge, uh, first, how does someone become a volunteer at the museum? Well, we are anxiously awaiting the arrival of our volunteers to come back. Um, so right now at CSU, the pandemic preparedness team has not given us approval to bring our volunteers back. Um, but when they do come back, and hopefully they all will, but there'll be a lot of work. Um, the volunteer program is run um, through me right now um, and Heather helps um, definitely with tracking and greeting and letting people in. And um, But yeah, it would just be contacting us through the main Avenir Museum um, email address. And then oh. we will, oh my goodness. Yeah, I got done. <laughs> the lights really went out. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, if we have space um, and need for specific skills, then we can definitely move the conversation forward. Awesome. And then our last question is, how has COVID changed what you can pull to use in the classroom? As in, do you worry about the virus being transported on the garments? Hi, mom. That's my mom asked that yes. question. Uh, I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> from she had a crazy Monday. So thanks for being here, mom. <laughs> that is something, you know, in the last fall, I was very concerned about this because we still really didn't know and they were doing a lot of studies. Um, there is a particular, there's a project called Realm is the, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's a whole project that um, people are testing different materials that are commonly found in library and museum collections, because this was a big concern for libraries as well of whether or not they could yeah. loan their materials out. Um, and so they did a, a whole series of tests on different um, things to see, you know, how long the, the virus was present and whether or not they thought it was still contagious you know, it ultimately what the tests were finding um, and what we seem to know now at this point is that it's not transmissible through surfaces like that, that it's really the air transmission. And this is, I am not a scientist, you know, this is not medical advice of any kind, but this was my assessment as the, as the curator and, you know, talking with Megan about about this, that last fall, my class, um, we moved it completely remotely online and what I did for the students in that class was that I went back into the storage areas myself with my cell phone and took videos and really close up so that they could still see and experience the textiles visual, 
digital lead that way. Mm -hmm. um, but this semester we felt a little bit more comfortable um, and it was also, this semester is the historic costume class where a lot of the things are on mannequins. And there was room in the classroom to put those things out where right now, because all of the tables are spread around the room and it's one table, there's no place to put something like a Paisley shawl um, for the class that is taught in the fall. So that was also kind of a challenge, but I did bring things from the collection out into the classroom um, during class sessions this spring semester. Um, but that definitely was something that we had to kind of figure out and consider um, in the early part of the pandemic and even several months into it of, of making sure again, like, are we caring properly for the collection? Um, because we don't want to put these things out and then ha have that virus be living on that thing and we put it back in storage and then it gets on everything else in the cabinet. Like, what does that mean? Um, and in particular, also caring for the people who work at the museum with the collection, we wouldn't want to have had that kind of sitting in the museum collection. Um, but we we now know that that really, it would not have be happening, so. That was all of the questions, but I will say some honorable mentions is that we have a request to bring back the Paisley exhibit again. Uh, Deb Catlow is very excited about Megan, Megan and Linda's favorite thing exhibit. Um, and just a, bu some, a bunch of, hey, I worked with this person and I did this and I dressed a mannequin with Barbara Bush's stuff. So it was some really great stuff. Yeah. yeah, some really great things in the chat. I'll be sure to share. I tried to write down all of them as much as I can and we can share a little bit later, but yeah. for now that was it. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you to Linda for, we're so fortunate that Linda is still so involved and Megan and I frequently email her or call her and say, Linda, what's going on? <laughs> we're, we're so glad that she's still here just down the street and, and loves to come and visit the museum and, and help us out with questions we have and continue to share all of the things that she knows about textiles and clothing and, and the things that we've got here. It's been great fun. Well, thank you so very much to all of you. This was absolutely wonderful. I know everyone in the chat is saying thank you as well for such a fabulous evening. It was very fun to see some of your favorites and hear about your experiences. Um, like I mentioned, I'll be sharing the recording to this video as well as a lot of the awesome resources that this wonderful team has available to you all. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out, but thank you truly to all of you for such a wonderful program and for taking us on a journey with you tonight. Hope everyone stays well, stay stalwart and go Rams. Rams. <laughs> That's such a good sign off, Rachel. Not thank to you. Me, but that was so good. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Everybody. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.